received a bunch of questions ahead of time, which we had a chance to um, look over. And I think a lot of those questions will be answered in our overview. And then we're happy to um, answer other questions that come up. So I'll, I'll, I can start. Um, my name is Becca Bell. I'm a pediatric ICU doctor at UVM Children's Hospital. And um, I live in Burlington. I am the current president of the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I also, um, I, you know, just because I think this is always relevant, I have a, a four-year-old and a five-year-old. Um, so I'm going to pass, pass it over to Ben Lee to introduce himself. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Ben Lee. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases specialist at the University of Vermont Children's Hospital. Um, I am, uh, my family and I live in South Burlington and, and like Dr. Bell, I have two school age kids. I have a third grader and a first grader. All right, and then Jill, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sure thing. Jill Briggs Campbell from the Agency of Education. As you can see, I'm still at work. And so I apologize, I'll be eating some dinner while we're on the call. Um, I, uh, in addition to um, heading up the COVID school testing program um, for the state of Vermont and leading that team, um, I also handle all of the federal emergency funds that have come in since the pandemic. And I'm also a mom to a seven and nine year old and live in Montpelier. Um, Dr. Holmes, do you mind introducing yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Brina Holmes. I am a general pediatrician and I'm faculty at uh, the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program. My children are 24, 23, and 21, but two of them are uh, teachers. So very uh, engaged with the school health team. Great, and I think, um, please let me know if anyone else should introduce themselves. Again, I think Dr. Cassell is um, gonna join us in a bit. So I think I, I can just start um, by talking a little bit about test to stay. So just as an overview, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the rationale behind you know, why we think this is a safe alternative to um, at-home quarantine when students are considered close contact. Dr. Lee is gonna talk a, a bit about um, antigen testing and PCR testing. There were a lot of questions about that. And then Jill was gonna talk about some of the logistics around timing and tests and consents and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and then we're happy to sort of field questions from there. So I'll just start and say that I think folks know a little bit about test to stay, but I'll just kind of start from the beginning and, get, and give more of a broad overview. So as everyone knows, and as those of us who are pediatricians are in, you know, parents and caregivers um, have really understood is that there's been a huge toll in terms of the effect on kids during this pandemic with um, missed in-person learning. And that's been very concerning for us. And we've really been worried about kids' um, mental health and their well-being and their development during this time. And so um, heading into the school year, it was really important to think about how we keep kids safe in school. Um, but also how we keep kids in school as much as possible. So um, I'll start with last spring, there was um, there, there are many school districts um, and researchers sort of looking at different mitigation strategies in schools and trying to understand what, um, what mitigation strategies really helped in terms of reducing transmission of COVID um, and what things were a little bit less impactful. Uh, a study came out over, it, it was actually not published, I think, until September or, or August, but um, looking at data from the spring in the UK. And what, what they did there was really pretty cool because we don't oftentimes have randomized control trials in pediatrics or during a pandemic, but they actually did a randomized control trial essentially looking at test this day. So they took 200 schools and randomize them to be either um, a test to stay school or a traditional at home quarantine school. And so what happened was when students were identified as being a close contact to a COVID case in the school setting, so a classmate had COVID, they're considered a close contact, 
if, if they were at a test to stay school, they would keep coming to school and get a rapid antigen test each day um, for seven days. Or the, the schools that were randomized not to do that just did what, what we do now. So they would stay home. And what the researchers looked at was what was the rate of students turning positive? What was the rate of community cases? Um, and what was the rate of cases in the school? And really found that there was no difference between the two groups. So um, that was really reassuring to say that, you know, in that setting, when you had an exposure, you were close contact in the school setting, that it was very reasonable and a safe alternative instead of quarantining at home to, to go to school and get a rapid antigen each day. So there were, there were some caveats to that. So all students who were um, taking part in tests this day had to wear masks. Um, only unvaccinated students took part in, in tests this day or in quarantine, um, similar, to, similar to how we're, we've set up here. And then students were asked to really quarantine at home outside of school. So on the weekends and in the evenings, um, not to be out and about, but to really be quarantining at home. So the other piece about that is, uh, you know, the big question everyone has is, is that relevant in the age of Delta? That was last spring. You'll, you'll recall that Delta was in the UK before it was here. And so actually the predominant strain during that study was Delta, although they kind of were during the study period that was sort of increasing in their, in their transmission. Um, so, so that was kind of helpful to know, but the question for us really was like, I don't know, is that still relevant to, to hear um, in this kind of bigger Delta surge? So what we have been looking at this, you know, collaborative effort between pediatricians, pediatric infectious disease folks, AOE, the health department is looking at other states that are doing this now as we speak in the age of Delta. And um, what we're seeing in our, um, with our neighbors in Massachusetts who actually have been set up to do this since the summer, they started planning for it. And they've been running tests to stay this school year is that they similarly are having about a two to 3% um, positive, two to 3% of students in the test to stay program are turning positive. Um, so, so still the same really pretty low rate and they've been able to save many, many school days um, by employing test to stay. There was a question where someone asked about the CDC and what, how, what they think about test to stay. And initially over the summer, they were, when asked about it, they sort of said, well, we're still looking at it. More recently, they now think it's very promising. And so they've been supporting and working with some other jurisdictions in the US around test to stay. So the CDC put on a call last week where they featured a few other places around the country that are doing this. So they featured the state of Kansas and um, Lake County, Illinois and Marietta County, Georgia, who are all doing test to stay. And they all reported out their data from this school year. And similarly, it's about two to 4% of, of their students are turning positive um, who are in the test to stay program. So that's sort of a broad overview of, of why we feel like this is a really safe alternative. So it doesn't, there's really no difference in terms of whether children are quarantining at home versus in this test to stay program after they've been exposed at school. And I should add that this is really about the exposure happening in the school setting because that's a pretty mitigated and managed setting. You know, it's not perfect, but it's very different than having an exposure in the home or it's different side but in an informal setting. So this only applies to students who've been exposed in the school setting um, because we know we have this data that's showing it's really just students are really positive. Um, so the test to stay program is only for that, um, that, that setting. Um, so I think I'm gonna, what I'll do is pause and turn it over to Dr. Lee to talk a little bit about um, so far up to this point, we've been doing a lot of talking a lot about PCRs and coming back to school with, with PCR tests and how rapid antigens can sort of fit into, um, into testing around schools. Um, thank you. Um, 
And yeah, I'm happy to um, um, to discuss this in a little bit more detail because um, I think it's a it's a reasonable question. So far throughout the course of this pandemic, there really has been an emphasis in Vermont on PCR testing. And the reason for that is a uh, PCR test is, is the gold standard. We know it's the best test, it's the most sensitive. Um, what that means, and the, the reason um, for that um, is that it can detect very, very, very low quantities of virus. Um, that's what a PCR test can do. Um, the difference between a PCR test and an antigen test is that the PCR test is trying to detect the nucleic acid or the genetic material that the virus is carrying, whereas an antigen test is testing for the actual proteins that, um, that make up the virus, um, the actual physical proteins themselves. Um, and because of the way the tests work, with the PCR test, you can start with a very, very small quantity of genetic material. And the PCR test, what, what it's designed to do is designed to copy that tiny amount of DNA or RNA over and over and over again. So with a very small amount of starting material, you can generate a lot of material that then can be detected. With an antigen test, um, it can't do that. It can only look for proteins that have already been made. Um, so whatever is already in there, um, that's what you're testing for. Um, now, each has its advantages and drawbacks. Um, the PCR test, as, as I mentioned, um, is the most sensitive. Um, it's the, considered what we call the gold standard um, for the fact that it can detect very low quantities of virus um, and is very accurate. However, even under ideal conditions, um, it usually takes hours um, to run those tests. And in most real world settings, um, the turnaround time for those tests are um, oftentimes, um, um, you know, one to three days. And so obviously that's not going to be practical um, when you need a quick answer, um, such as for a test to stay program. The antigen tests, um, those take about 15 minutes. So you can get a very quick answer. So it's practical for using, you know, prior to entering a specific location, like, like a school. Um, now the antigen test does have a lower sensitivity than the PCR. That means it will miss more infections. However, the reason why, uh, you know, the, the compelling difference and why I feel quite comfortable saying that, um, that they can be used safely in a test to play program or test to stay program um, is that there actually is a pretty big difference if you're talking about a single one-off test, just a single point in time versus doing multiple tests um, on a daily basis. And there are um, studies that have looked at this. And if you're, if you're looking at just doing a single test at a single point in time, the sensitivity of the antigen test can become an issue because you know you're gonna be missing some of those infections. However, if you use this in a way that you're testing re repeatedly, either daily or every two days, every three days, um, what the data indicate are that the sensitivity of the test, so the ability for the antigen test to detect the virus if it's there, um, really becomes almost equivalent to the performance of a PCR test um, if they're being done um, more than once. Um, so the way that the test to stay program in Vermont is, is designed um, for daily antigen tests, um, we believe um, we are able to overcome that limitation in sensitivity um, due, to, um, due to the multiple testing. Um, method. And so I think there really is a strong scientific basis for saying, even though it's a less sensitive test, when used in this manner, um, we are still are going to get um, very, um, you know, very, very good results. Particularly, um, get, getting back to Dr. Pell's um, most recent point, um, the final point she made, particularly when we're talking about exposures in a setting where the risk of infection and the risk of transmission is um, very low to begin with. Um, so for those reasons, uh, you know, the, despite the known limitations of antigen tests, when they're being used in these settings, in this manner, uh, we can really overcome, um, overcome the limitations of, of those tests. Thanks very much. Um, Jill, do you mind chatting a bit about um, 
it, it, we had a lot of, it seemed like a lot of questions about people who are like, when is this going to start? And what's the timing on this? And some of the, the logistics around it. Yeah, sure thing. And I see Dr. Costello got in here. So that's great. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit about this and then answer any questions and, and dive into the details. So um, I think it's important to understand that test to stay exists in sort of a larger uh, school COVID testing um, framework. So the intention of uh, the state um, was as we saw the impact of the Delta variant on schools, we saw the impact of more and more children missing school because of quarantine. Um, I have been there myself. Um, there was a an understanding that there was a need to pivot from what we had done last year and sort of had thought about doing earlier this year, which was surveillance testing to uh, what we're calling response testing. So testing that is done in response to a positive case in the school. And so test to stay is one of those tools. And in particular, where you have a high prevalence of um, COVID and you're having a, a lot of kids being quarantined, um, it's a really important and powerful one. And I, I think that in the Champlain Valley and particularly in Wills, Williston, we're seeing those impacts, right? Um, in addition, there's also uh, PCR testing that can be done in response as well. And this was also in response to situations that we were seeing arise in this district and several other districts where when you had many, many children in quarantine, they were all coming out of quarantine on the same day. They were going down to their local testing clinic and sort of overwhelming that system, which then meant that there was really serious delays in getting um, testing uh, results back. So all of the kind of new tools that we have sort of developed here have been in response to the situation on the ground and a need to address sort of the education impacts of Delta in particular, right? It's a different situation than we were in last year. So the way that the test to stay program um, would play out is that uh, you would identify that there's a positive case in the school. Um, the school nurses would then do contact tracing. And we've really been working very closely with all of our partners, including Dr. Bell and Dr. Lee. Um, we've worked with our nurses out in the field. Uh, to get their feedback and, and understand that contact tracing has been a major resource um, intensive process and that the results of contact tracing have, um, have not necessarily been great from an education perspective, right? So um, it's still an important tool, but now really understanding that contact tracing is to identify the kids that can then be tested right, for a test to stay program. So seeing it as part of that whole process is a really important one. Um, so if we have a, a student that's identified as a positive case in the school, uh, the nurses would then do contact tracing, identify who those close contacts are. And then what you would expect to see is some sort of communication from your school that would say, hey, your kid has been identified as a close contact. We are starting test to stay tomorrow. And so, uh, you know, the next day um, you would have your, every school is going to handle the logistics a little bit differently here, but the idea is that before the kids enter the building or enter the, you know, they may be sequestered off um, if it's a really cold day or something like that, um, they would come in. Uh, there would be sort of stations set up, there would be staff there to support it, and they would do the antigen test. Now, for students from the age of five, which is the, the lower age limit, five to 14, um, per the manufacturer's instructions, that test needs to be, that swab, nasal swab, we're all familiar with it at this point, needs to be administered by an adult. Uh, if you are 15 and up, get to self-swab. Um, the test kit itself is a really basic kit. I want to sort of emphasize this is the same exact kit that you and I could go buy from Walgreens if they were in stock, which they never are. Um, but it is that level of kit. It's very, very simple. Uh, and in addition, um, your child should already be registered in Simple Report. I'll talk about that in just a moment as one of kind of two logistical pieces that folks need to, to handle ahead of time. 
Um, and so the sort of the test uh, kit gets run, the timer starts for 15 minutes. Children watch Lion King. I don't know what y'all are gonna do with them for 15 minutes, but uh, they will wait for the 15 minutes and they get their test result. So they're, if they're negative, then they're gonna just go and do their regular learning in their regular classroom environment. If they are positive, then they will be sort of uh, taken away discreetly from the area with the other kids and they will need to be sent home. So from the perspective of the family, that means that there needs to be an understanding that if you are opting in, and this is an opt-in to test to stay, that you have an understanding that if your child comes up positive, you will they will be sent home. So. Um, whatever that means for you logistically is something to bear in mind here. So uh, the, the marker for test to stay, it's seven days from the last day of exposure. So how that plays out over the weekends, because this has come up a lot, when, and I'll just say before I get into the weekends, when your child, if you're doing test to stay, is out of school, they should be in quarantine, essentially. So if they're out of school or out of, say, like their... Um, after school activity that may be attached to the school. We can talk about some of the details of that. Um, they should be in quarantine. They should not be going out with friends. They should not be going to the grocery store. They should not be engaging in uh, sports or other extracurriculars that involve students from other schools. Um, and over the weekend, it should be the same thing. Essentially, they are in quarantine. They're not playing rec league soccer or anything like that. Uh, if the seven days, which obviously it will, falls on a weekend day, right? So let's say, fake example, a student is identified as positive on Monday. The kids start test to stay on Tuesday morning. So they would test Tuesday, I gotta keep count for myself, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, that seven days, they would come back and test again on Monday as well. Did I catch that right? Somebody do my math for me, it's very late. All right, so over the weekend, and then you would test that one or two additional days to sort of close out your seven day period. So when you are opting into the program, you are opting into quarantining when they're not at school, you're opting into not engaging with friends, you're opting in to the fact that you're not gonna be playing um, sports or doing extracurriculars that are interacting with other schools. Uh, so that's part of the program, but what you are benefiting from here is, is no lost instructional days, right? Your kid gets to be in school and sort of have that regular experience. So that's how it sort of looks uh, in, in sort of the day-to-day the -day world. Some key pieces here, because I have been working with your COVID coordinator for the district, Jocelyn, who's been amazing, um, and we've been working really quickly to get Test to Stay stood up. In, um, in Champlain Valley. So what you, Jocelyn, I'm not sure if she's already sent out the, the email to families. So if that's happened, then this will be old news to folks. Um, but what you will be getting is a link to a consent web form. That consent is for all response testing. So you're not just consenting test to stay, you're consenting to response PCR testing. And there's a really important reason that folks should be aware of, because this will be a question that comes up. We needed to build that response test, uh, response consent form uh, broadly because technologies are shifting very rapidly right now. And so when you are consenting for your child to do response testing, oh, thank you. Okay, it's for everybody in Chittenden County. Great, thanks. Big broad swath here. So when you are consenting to response testing for your child, um, it could be a PCR test, uh, it could be an antigen test to stay, and it may be some of the other technologies that we're looking at, so that are coming down the line. But all of it is a nasal swab, and that's really sort of the important piece here. So that's what you're consenting to, is that your child would be swabbed and then they would run the test. Uh, so, uh, you're going to do the consent web form, critical piece number one. Critical piece number two is that you will also be given a link to self-register in Simple Report. And Simple Report 
is a very handy tool that takes care of all the reporting requirements, but it also has the ability, if you provide your um, contact information, your email or your cell phone number, that you will be able to get instantaneous results from the antigen tests. So if you are waiting in the parking lot, you will get pinged on your phone, get, you know, your child's negative and you can go about your day. Um, so that's a really important piece of it. So there's sort of two steps that families are going to need to take, the consent and then the self-registration and simple report. And I wanna just emphasize one thing, self-registration and simple report is not consent. You need to do both things. And if for some reason you miss it, I do this all the time, uh, you know, didn't read the instructions as carefully as you wanted to, um, your nurse or uh, whoever sort of running the, the testing program will be able to obtain your consent day of. You can even, oh my gosh, I'm in the car and I forgot to do consent. You'll get an email and you can show that consent was, was done. So um, there are options there as well. Uh, so with that, I think I'll sort of wrap up. That is kind of the test to stay program in a nutshell and what you all can be expecting as sort of the work that you need to do to, to opt your child in. Jill, can, this is Leah Costello. I'm from Timberlane Pediatrics. I'm sorry I was joined late. Um, I Can you help further clarify? Because there are several children I know in our district, but I'm sure in other districts who go to an alternative program some days a week, like farm school. Mm -hmm. and if they are in test to stay, those alternative programs would not offer test to stay at their, um, at that day program, what um, are they allowed to participate in their other schooling or is that considered an out of school activity that they need to refrain from? Well, I, I'm not going to make policy on the fly, but that's a really good question. And actually, so maybe Dr. something Bell, we could get back. Yeah, I was going to say, Dr. Bell and Dr. Lee and I meet tomorrow morning. So why don't we bring that back to the team? And it's a really good question. Yeah. And then I will, as you were sort of asking that, I did want to clarify one more thing that I think has been coming up a lot. Um, it's important to clarify what test to state is for and what it is not for. It is not. Um, a way to, I think my kid has a cold, I'm going to send them to school, they do an antigen test, it comes up negative, why can't they stay in school, they don't have COVID, right? I will fully admit that I have done that as a parent before. Uh, that is not what this is for. This is not for symptomatic children. We are no longer in, in a world where our symptomatic kids get to be in school. So, um, there is a, um, the ability of schools, if they're using PCR response testing, uh, to be able to do that much more rapidly. Um, and those will be some testing tools that will be available, but it is not a way to have your symptomatic child be in school. I would, Aliyah, I can add a little bit to the after school stuff. So. Um, what we have we have talked about is if there's an after school programming at the school um, or school sponsored after school program, that's fine to stay if you're in test to stay. I think you brought up something specific about a more um, outside of the outside of a school sponsored thing that's happening after school. Um, and well, we can discuss that in our meeting, but I think what, what we're really saying is within the school environment, we have a sense and we have data around how transmission happens. And so we feel comfortable saying that someone can continue to be in that kind of school setting. And, and we've talked too about even staying after school um, to practice with your team, um, but not to interact with another school in an interscholastic game or not to travel, you know, to another <laughs> school, you know. Um, so it's really, it's really saying, you know, you're in this environment, we know, um, you have a good sense of what happens with this, within this environment, we feel like it's, it's fairly well mitigated and managed and you can stay all day if that includes after school, if that includes um, sports that are happening at school and not with other students from another school. And part of that is just sort of thinking through if that student turns positive the next day, what does that mean in terms of then retracing and doing more who's close, who all is close contact and how do we sort of manage that? So what we're trying to do is not expand 
the potential pool of close contacts, we're trying to keep it small. Um, but if, if students are sort of with these folks most of the day, then, and they've tested negative that day, um, we feel comfortable having them stay through the day through all these school sponsored events. If they then go as a single person to this other, you know, outside of school event, then you've expanded the pool of potential close contacts. So that's, that's the way we approach thinking about how to make policy around this. This is Heidi and I have a question for Jill. Is now an okay time? And first of all, I'm very excited that Colchester is offering this and um, I'm very much looking forward to it. Just thinking about, um, you know, supply chain and ensuring that test kits are readily available to allow this and support it. How will the state ensure that there are um, rapid tests available and at the school when they need to be? And what's the plan if, if they're not available? Yeah, it's a really important question. It's it's a good good chunk of my job these days, Heidi. <laughs> so um, when we when we looked at rolling out this program, the very very first question that everybody had to answer is what is the supply chain. Um, and so what we did uh, on the state side is we did modeling of what we call the burn rate um, of how many tests you might use in a week. It's been based on positivity rates, vaccination rates, and some very other sophisticated stuff in spreadsheets that I don't pretend to understand all of. Um, and that's generated um, basically a four week supply model. And based on that, uh, we had the confidence to be able to move forward with this program. Um, so in terms of the supply chain, I mean, it, it is challenging. I'm not, I'm in no way going to say that the, this isn't a national conversation that's happening and not a conversation that happens every day um, on our team. Uh, it is important because of that um, to recognize that uh, using the test to stay program really needs to be for those, you know, unvaccinated, asymptomatic, close contacts using the, the new contact tracing memo. It's important and we are really trusting the schools to, um, to sort of follow those use cases and protocols. Uh, and so, you know, that is something that we are continually working with. We work really closely with our our vendors and we also are always looking at ways to diversify the supply chain. That's actually why I'm sort of pointing to this with the response consent form. We are looking to have a response consent form that can accommodate any kind of response testing technology that comes on the market that our team says, yes, like this is an appropriate uh, use for our schools. So um, in anticipation, of potential supply chain issues down the road, we're actually trying to get ahead of that as, as much as we can. So I guess, um, and follow up to that, what is the plan if supplies aren't available? And this may, this is on the heels on Monday, at least at one of our schools, we weren't able to conduct um, surveillance, test surveillance testing. Supplies yeah. didn't arrive from the state. So I'm just wondering what that plan is, if it's you know day two of the test to stay or day three and we realize, oh gosh, we don't have enough test kits, then what's, yeah, and Heidi, that was a really unfortunate situation, and that wasn't a supply chain issue. It was a, it was a, an error that happened essentially. Um, and so, um, what I would say is that um, we have some. So the way that we've pushed out these antigen test kits, uh, which I think Colchester received today, um, was uh, to start from a two-week supply chain uh, using those modeling numbers. Uh, the districts, um, independent schools will actually have a web form. They'll be able to order uh, every single week to resupply. And generally speaking, I would say we have the ability to respond really, really quickly, particularly in Chittenden County, because that's where the warehouse is. So um, if anyone is encountering those kinds of issues, like the one that, that you had, Heidi, I would say reach out to me and I can get immediately in touch with the warehouse, we have the ability to respond to emergencies very, very quickly, um, and, and in your area in particular. Um, so you have the close contact. That's sort of the nice thing about Vermont is that usually the distance between you and the person you need to talk to is like one or two at the most. Call me. 
and I will get it sorted out. But I wouldn't anticipate that you would be short antigen test kits uh, because of the way that we built the system. And just to clarify, I'm a parent, not a- Oh, I'm sorry. Worker, yeah. It did happen. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Well, Heidi, yeah, that's okay. you can call me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I need you to test it. Yeah. And then um, one other question I had is, will children be allowed to ride the bus when they're doing the test to stay? Yes, they will. And But it is important, again, to note that if you're opting your child in, then you are recognizing that if they are a bus kid, then if they come up positive, you need to have the ability to, you know, your, your child will be put into isolation in, in the school and sort of separated, but you need to have the ability to come get that child. Yeah. I think, Jill, that this segues nicely into the fact that we are rolling out a vaccine for five to 11 year olds very soon. And this may not be, um, quite as much for you, but with um, Becca and uh, <laughs> Dr. Bell and Dr. Lee, that how will this change with kids being vaccinated? When are we considering children fully vaccinated? Um, and I, um, and how are you anticipating this program even phasing out a little bit as we reach high vaccination levels for our five to 11 year olds? I can start a little bit with the timing. So um, we anticipate potentially being able to start vaccinating five to 11 year olds um, as soon as a week from now. So potentially starting November 4th or November 5th, which is really exciting. We, um, for folks that don't know, it's a different dose and it's a different vial. And so we have to get shipments from the federal government. And so there are plans across the state for how we can have access, so how families can have access to this vaccine throughout the state. But it probably won't be that everyone who wants one on the, in the first you know, three or four or five days can get one right away. Um, primary care offices will start getting shipments of the pediatric vaccine probably closer to mid-November. There'll be school located clinics starting probably the second week in November. So, um, folks will be able to start getting vaccinated in November. So remember it's one vaccine and then three weeks later, a second dose. And then two weeks after that, that we really feel like people have reached their full immunity at that point. Um, so what, so that's, we're really looking at the rest of the calendar year, right? Even for the children that are getting vaccinated, um, right away, we're looking at through the calendar year and what we're all sort of we're super excited about the vaccine. I mean, I really think this is a game changer. At the same time, we still have a few months of like really important learning that we got to get through and we got to keep children in school. And so as your children are getting vaccinated over the next few weeks, um, they're not fully vaccinated, right? Until do dose one, three weeks, dose two, two more weeks. And so if they're considered a close contact during that time, they'll still have to follow the protocol of quarantine or test to stay. Um, and so I think that we are really focusing on trying to make these next couple months really um, great for kids. And we know that kids aren't gonna be able to be fully immunized you know, next week. And so this program is running through, through the rest of the calendar year for sure. And then what's, what we need to constantly reevaluate is what's the community transmission rate? What kind of case rates do we have? What kind of hospitalization rates do we have? What's happening in the schools? And all that can help inform us for next year, we still have kids under five who aren't eligible, probably won't be eligible until like midwinter. So all of that factors in um, to, you know, how this, how future contact tracing and quarantine will go in the, in the schools. I think one thing that's really helpful to know is that unfortunately SARS-CoV-2 as a virus is not going away. And so understanding how the virus works, what situations can make contact or exposure more risky and having the ability to test symptomatic kids in the school, um, having the ability to potentially test a group of, ch of children if needed after an exposure, I think is going to, I guess, kind of unfortunately be something that we might do on and off for a long time now. So it's good to have these protocols in place and to understand how the, how the testing works. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add about those predictions. 
I don't, I can just add a little bit more from, again, sort of the logistics side of things um, in terms of the, the vaccination campaign that's gonna be rolling out. You will be seeing um, vaccine clinics being held in elementary schools. We've really been deliberate. I think it's been helpful that you have so many people on this, this uh, logistics and planning that do have young kids that can raise their hand and say like, I'm not comfortable sending my kid to a high school to do this, right? Like that's, that's not gonna work. Um, so we are gonna see vaccination clinics in elementary schools. You're going to see them um, sort of to overlap with sort of after hours so that parents can, can, or before school so that parents can be present. I know probably mine will, will want me to be there. Um, and also um, that sort of support from uh, your pediatric community, pediatricians being able to, to answer questions are gonna be crucial to that as well. Um, but you will be seeing um, a lot of information coming out from the Agency of Education in the next several weeks as well around uh, the in-school vaccine clinics. And, um, you know, it, it is, I think that Dr. Bell is right that there is sort of this, this time period um, where things are going to be sort of in flux. It's going to take a while to get sort of younger age kids to high rates of vaccination, and we recognize that. And so these testing programs are sort of part of the environment that keeps kids in school. And at the same time, um, you know, getting those high rates of vaccination, we've already seen in places like, um, you know, some of our high schools with high vaccination rates there, it really has alleviated the pressure of having so many kids be in quarantine. So um, you will be seeing a lot more logistical information coming out from the state as well. And I um, know specifically that they are trying to put school-based vaccination clinics in areas that may not have as much access to, um, to other forms of receiving the vaccine. So like pharmacies or their um, medical homes um, and as, Dr. Bell alluded to, we in medical home, like so your pediatrician's office or your doctor's office may aren't able to get order the vaccine until the second week of November. But I know specifically that CVSD is not having a school-based clinic um, early on, at least, that they are going to be in other areas in Chittenden County. And it's just around um, number of vaccines that we're able to get right away and equity um, to accessing vaccines. So, but we all are very excited about vaccines and we will actually be hosting um, question and answer sessions on vaccines starting the week of November 8th. Um, so we will get that out to families as well where that will be specific to, um, to vaccines. The, um, I'm getting a few questions in here. Um, so a couple are related to vaccinated kids, Vac uh, just to clarify, vaccinated children who have completed two weeks post their second dose of their vaccine do not need to participate in test to stay. So there is not, um, someone asked about privacy around vaccination status. Um, there, the, um, folks who are vaccinated do not need to participate in test to stay. Um, we do suggest a PCR test three to five days after your exposure. Um, if you are, if your child is vaccinated, um, this is not required for return to school. They can continue in school um, even if they are a close contact. If your child is vaccinated, um, but the next set of questions coming in is around um, false positives for the antigen testing and what you recommend doing if a child does test positive. Um, I'll turn that over to Dr. Lee or Dr. Bell, what, um, what you recommend if that happens. So in general, we're not recommending that um, children who test positive with an antigen test if they're participating in the test to say program, needs to have a confirmatory PCR test. Um, now, there are individual scenarios or cases that might arise um, such that, you know, for, for various reasons that um, there might be other compelling factors that might go into a decision whether a child who has a positive antigen test um, ends up getting a subsequent PCR test. If you have both an antigen test and a PCR test, <clears throat> um, particularly if the PCR test was done um, 
in, in close proximity to the antigen test, usually we would be willing to trust the PCR result. Um, there are potentials for false positives with the rapid tests. Um, the rate, the likelihood of that is low. Um, it's really um, similar to the risk of false positives with uh, PCR tests. The, the challenge is that in the era of Delta, it, it's really hard for me to try to argue um, that any test should be assumed to be a false positive just because it's so ubiquitous, um, especially in younger kids, the likelihood of asymptomatic infections is higher. Um, so there, you know, when we factor all that in, um, I don't think there's a compelling reason to say that anybody who has a positive antigen test has to have a confirmatory PCR test. Um, we would just stop with a positive antigen. If there are scenarios where uh, there is a negative PCR test, um, it would be something that has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, it, it, in general, um, um, a PCR test does it is more accurate than an antigen test, so we need to take that into consideration. Um, if there's a if there's a big sort of difference in time between when the two tests were taken, you, you really can't make any heads or tails of of them. Um, so it's it's a really narrow sort of um, range of scenarios where, where this, where this may come up. Can I ask a question? Hey. Can you guys hear me? Yes. We are asking folks to just type them in if, um, but, but because the but CDC so, says it, to not it, use a PCR test. So why are we talking about PCR tests? The CDC says to not use them because I can't distinguish between flu and COVID. And it's amazing yeah. that the flu magically disappeared last year. So why are we using PCR testing? I'm just confused because the CDC says not to use them. So I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to when the CDC says not to use It's them, on the CDC but... website to not use PCR testing because I can't distinguish between COVID and the flu. So go to the uh, website. It says it. If, if you would like to post the link or forward it to me, I'd be happy to. Review. You're the doctor. I shouldn't have to tell you. I shouldn't have to educate you guys. You're well, supposed we to be are well informed. With all, um, okay, with all due you are. With all due respect. We'll just have to have you turn off your um, your microphone right now and let Dr. Lee answer the, the question. Well, the, the reason I'm confused is that statement is just completely inaccurate. Uh, PCR of course, test it's from the CDC is, website. So, of course, it's false. A PCR test is designed to measure a single pathogen only. The way they're designed is you have to know what you're looking for. I know um, how it works. The CDC says to not use it. Okay. Again, if you'd like to forward, just have to, uh, your forward the information, the information. To me, then I'm happy to respond offline. Um, the um, the other question. So this, I think, what Dr. Lee was just referring to around um, the if you have a positive test that the child will, if you have a positive antigen test, the child will have to leave the school and the parent can decide if they want to go confirm with their doctor or confirm at the health department with a PCR testing. It is not necessary. I just realized I'm muted. The, um, the, um, so the parent would need to take the child for the confirmation PCR testing. Those are not being offered at school. You do not need to do that as Dr. Lee just said, but if you choose to do that as a parent, that would be um, your responsibility. And obviously the, your child would need to leave school if they do have a positive antigen testing. Um, another question that came in is if we find out that um, someone was a close contact six days ago, and the next day that they go to school is their seventh day. Do we do the antigen testing that day, the test to stay program, or do they do a PCR testing? So they, they would do the antigen that day. Um, and I think, you know, that, that would might be a case that, um, the, the school might want to um, talk a little bit with the epi the the health department epi team about and kind of go through the exposures and make sure we feel really well covered by that but um, we would do the antigen we, we do understand and somebody um, asked to about what day when people do turn positive what day is it going to be and or generally in test to stay and a lot of that depends on when the exposure happened because let's say for example you had a child who comes to school, on a Monday, 
they start to get to they start to get symptomatic during the school day. They go see the school nurse. They do a rapid. It's positive. You know, they get home, and then the next day, the plan is made to do tests to say that exposure was just the day before, right? Um, whereas in some in some cases, children wake up feeling ill. They go and get a PCR test, and we might not know for a few days. And so, in that case, the test to say program is might be two or three days long because you're up to, you, you get to your seven days quicker. So um, I, you know, there could be a situation, as you mentioned, where the exposure has happened long ago, maybe a child then stayed out of school for a few days and then got tested and then it took two more days. And so if that were to happen, I think just reviewing with the epi team, the epidemiology team from the health department would be helpful, but I think just, I would just do the antigen. And I, um, I'd like, I'd like to jump in because this is, uh, it's a great question and it has come up in, in discussions before. Um, so I agree. I mean, the, the antigen test should still be done on day seven. Um, but I, I think this is a scenario also where there may be some discussion about whether, um, whether those, um, specific exposures could also do like a day seven PCR as, as a take home, you know, or, or something like that. Um, and not have to exclude them from school um, while while that's happening, um, because uh, as I mentioned before, the, the greatest strength of the antigen tests is when they're used um, sort of um, in, um, in in a setting where you're doing multiple in a row. Um, I I don't know if that scenario had would have you know come up um, thus far where the exposure was determined. You know, it took exactly that length of time such that this would happen. Um, but if it does happen, I think it's something that um, uh, we probably just would have a conversation with the health department and um, um, and the folks in the in the um, in AOE, et cetera, um, and to chart a path forward. I think that's just an important point to go back to is that we always have these teams. So in my my practice, I have called Dr. Lee at night to run cases by him and say, what, what do you think in this one that's different? Or called the epi team at the Vermont Department of Health. And there's going to be times that your pediatrician or the school team may, um, or your family doctor may in, include that to talk about like these situations of a positive antigen test, but a negative, you know, immediately obtained PCR test. And so those individualized cases, um, may come up and we are here to support you, um, your, your school staff through that. Um, a scenario was presented by another um, listener that if a classroom is identified as a close contact, um, the whole classroom is involved in tests to stay and we find out two days in that one of those kids tests positive that morning on test to stay, does that all start over again for that whole classroom? So everybody is nodding yes, um, that yes, it starts over again. But again, you can continue to stay, your child can continue to stay in school if they remain asymptomatic. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in regarding um, who the, where the close contact needs to be. Um, and I think that's just important to reiterate that these are only for in school close contact. So this is not some a close contact that was identified out of school, like a birthday party or a, um, even if it was a classmate, if you, the close contact was out of school, test to stay does not, um, it, it does not apply in those situations. And it, it is still extraordinarily important that we keep our kids home if they're sick. It is so hard. I know I'm a parent of three, it's impossible, but they have to stay home if they are sick. Um, and that is really the key to success, to keeping our students healthy, our staff healthy, because there are other viruses other than COVID. There are a lot of other, a lot of illnesses are other viruses right now, but, um, but making sure we're not sending our kids to school ill at all. Um, ill children, this is not, this is for asymptomatic close contacts. So those are kids who do not have any symptoms at all can be participate in this. But if your child has a runny nose and they're participating in test to stay, they can't come to school. They can't come to school and do test to stay. They have to stay home and get a test through their primary care office, the health department, um, or um, other venues in your area. 
Um, Leah, I'm gonna jump in and talk a little bit about um, why we're not, um, why vaccinated students and folks are not involved in the in quarantine or, or test to stay, because there, there have been a few questions about that. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about the pandemic and how to approach it, um, we think about, um, you know, I think there are sort of two categories. There's like what's possible and then what is likely. And what we're really trying to do is to sort of squash this pandemic as and decrease community transmission in addressing the most likely scenarios where transmission is occurring. Um, and so the question is with the Delta variant, um, we know that vaccinated people can get infected. It's possible that they get infected. It's possible that they can then transmit to others. It is much less likely though that they do that compared to someone who's unvaccinated. So if you um, are in a room and there's some vaccinated people and some unvaccinated people and there's someone with COVID, those who are unvaccinated are more likely to become infected. And then they're also more likely to transmit it. So those who are vaccinated, although they can transmit the virus, um, if they get infected, then their infectious period is shorter because their immune system has, has seen this before, they've been vaccinated and they're able to sort of clear the infection quicker. We do have some data around vaccinated, vaccinated folks and transmission um, where they've done some genomic testing on the Provincetown outbreak, which I think folks know about because that happened in July where a lot of vaccinated people in Provincetown got, got, um, got COVID and then some transmitted it. And that was sort of our first clue into that, um, into that happening. So the genomic data where they can actually see where the spread happened really pinpoints that the, the vaccinated folks that spread the virus were symptomatic. And so that leads back to what Dr. Costello said is that we are, and this is really hard for families too, um, we are really strict about not having symptomatic students in school, whether or not you're vaccinated. So if you're symptomatic, you stay home, you have to get a, a, a PCR test and you can't return until your symptoms are improved. And that's for vaccinated folks as well. And that's based on the fact that vaccinated folks that transmit are, are usually symptomatic. Um, and so, so I think that piece is important. And then we also have a recommendation if you're, uh, if you're a close contact to, um, and you're vaccinated to get tested a few days later as well, but that we don't need, you don't need to be excluded. You don't need to quarantine um, away from folks. So that data that we have around the two to 4% is really all among unvaccinated people. Vaccinated would be, that population would be even smaller in terms of who would, who would convert and who would turn positive. And we know that they're not main drivers of the transmission, of transmission forward. They can, they absolutely can, but it's just not as likely. So that's the rationale behind that. And that's true. It's not just Vermont, this, you know, the CDC and, um, every other state, they're not, they're not quarantining those who are vaccinated. Um, thank you for that clarification and bringing it back to the science around what we saw this summer in Provincetown. Um, a few um, questions are pouring in, these are great. Um, so continuing to reiterate that this is a voluntary program. Um, so it's not mandated, it is, um, you can elect in. Um, somebody asked about privacy for those who are participating in the test to stay um, program. Um, I'm not sure if Jill, if you have comments on that, but I, I'm sure it's probably just going to be school based and unfortunately, probably a, a, a classroom where other kids will know who's participating. So if that um, that's unfortunate. We just don't have the individual space for that at schools. And I think if that's a concern, um, it may not be a program you want to opt into. Um, but Jill might be able to comment a little bit more on that. No, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. This is definitely a question that we've we've talked about a lot. Um, and it is going to be sort of school-based um, in, in trying to find ways to communicate with families ahead of time. Um, the consent does talk a little bit about this, sort of like the somewhat public setting of this. Um, and yeah, there isn't a great answer on that one, um, but it is, it is something to, to consider. And, and we do, um, you know, make recommendations to schools about like, 
you know, how, how to handle all of these kinds of issues. Um, I think there is also probably a recognition that we all have that generally speaking in schools, there's a lot of crosstalk that's happening. Um, and so if we're recognizing the, the somewhat unfortunate realities that probably in most schools, people know who COVID positive cases probably are. Um, but yeah, I'm, yeah, it is, it's a tough, it's a tough part of this. Um, and it is something to consider in consent. The other question, and I will, there's one major question that I'll get to in just a minute, but um, somebody asked about families doing this at home, um, which in their own antigen testing that they can magically find at Walgreens, um, but can um, someone comment on, um, on that and why it needs to be school-based testing? Yeah, so this is something that we've also talked a lot about and, and um, there may come a time in the future uh, where this is a model that, that sort of generally in society we move to. Um, you know, you open your cabinet and you've got antigen tests to hand. Um, in terms of the test to stay program, um, there's a few factors, uh, but some of the most important is, is how results get reported and um, how they would be reported back to the school, right? Um, so it is important that we're utilizing a system that reports results to our Department of Health. Uh, it reports results obviously to the family and it reports results to the school in real time. Um, and you know how if you were doing like a at home test, there isn't really a great way to sort of verify that short of your child showing up with a used, you know, antigen test kit, which is not ideal. Um, so that is sort of one of the, the also say going back to the question about supply chain, um, there are uh, the over the counter test, which is what that is schools are going to be using a, a, the same test, but it, it has a particular waiver attached to it. The over the counter test supply chain is challenging. Um, and so we, um, I think it's good to know uh, for folks sort of awareness um, that the way that our school testing programs, the whole range of them, the whole toolkit, as I like to think of it, um, while from the sort of the, the view of the family or even the school, sometimes it may be like, why, you know, why so complex? Why this way? Why, you know, this form of consent form? A lot of that has to do with um, our ability to re retain flexibility. Um, in the context of things like supply chain and resources and staffing in the school and all these different things that have come up. So um, that was certainly a, um, an option that was very closely examined. And um, you know, maybe someday in the future that will be uh, an option available, but it's, it's not appropriate for the test to state program at this time. So one um, large question that's come in, and I assume many parents on this call are from our Williston School in the CVSD district that has um, unfortunately continued to have positive cases, um, which we have looked at very closely and cannot um, determine why, um, you know, what factors in school we can change um, that, um, but we are unfortunately continuing to experience an outbreak in our Williston school. Um, we are very excited for tests to stay for the Williston school, um, for all the schools, but particularly for that one. I know there's many parents who've been through one, two, three quarantines. It's been really challenging. I really, um, I am sorry. I am sure that is really hard. Um, but the questions about, you know, this just doesn't seem to be working in their school. Um, and I think it's hard to hear that this is a low risk, school is a low risk transmission when there have been many cases in Williston. Um, and um, I don't know if Dr. Lee, you have any comments just around um, school-based transmission, how we can continue to prevent school-based transmissions. Um, and um, we don't have any rates. We don't know the rates of transmission in our schools, um, but we are just seeing a lot of school-aged children getting COVID right now, unfortunately. Um, and um, and just how we're continuing to look at this and monitor it and um, continue to do best for our families and our children. 
Yeah, so I can um, make, I guess, just some general comments. So um, w with apologies, I don't know necessarily the, all the fine details about, um, about the cases or the, um, for the outbreaks um, that are happening in Williston, although um, um, clearly, you know, you know, hearing from friends um, through the medical community that, that, there, that there has been a lot of cases there. So certainly, um, we're not trying to make the argument that in-school transmission never happens or, or doesn't happen. Um, however, I, I think the uh, thing to keep in mind here is, is not, um, not test to stay as being designed to halt all transmissions. Um, and particularly, um, as, as we've been talking about, it, it's not designed to address at all the transmissions that are happening in the community, so at home, in you know, informal social gatherings, um, that sort of thing. Um, but really, what the goal is, how many kids have been through you know, one, two, or three quarantines that never got infected and lost you know, one, two, three weeks of school time? That, that's really where we're trying to move the needle, uh, because it is unfortunate that um, you know, in the era of Delta, um, you know, we do recognize that we're going to have higher case numbers now, um, not just in school age kids, but as we've as we witnessed across all of Vermont, we're seeing some of the worst numbers than at other um, than at previous stages in the pandemic. Um, but what we're really, really hoping to do is to limit the impact of unnecessary school exclusion um, with with test to stay. And so I think that's just important to remember that. Uh, you know, we're not arguing that um, outbreaks aren't going to happen or that um, in-school transmissions will never occur, um, but can we just limit the impact of that by keeping the kids who are safe to remain in school um, the ability to do that? <clears throat> I might add to, I'm, I'm getting some questions as well, um, just to, so again, I think we always, um, we sometimes think about settings where there are people there that we don't know as being um, a more high risk setting. And then oftentimes when we're with people that we know, we tend to think of that as a low risk setting. That's like just natural. Um, and so when we were able to earlier on the pandemic really trace every, every case, we know that the high risk areas are certainly in the home for sure. And we definitely see children who are infected with COVID-19 who are living in homes with adults and older siblings who are eligible, all eligible to be vaccinated who are not. So certainly getting vaccinated and vaccinating folks who live in your home who are eligible to be vaccinated really, really helps. Um, and then other informal gatherings that are inside. So, um, you know, thinking ahead to this weekend and Halloween outdoor activities are, you know, we feel are really safe. Um, we did see an increase in COVID um, trend outbreak last year after Halloween really connected to indoor gatherings of like really like kind of parties and in, inside with multiple families and multiple groups of, of people. So I think thinking about those settings where we tend to let our guard down because we feel really comfortable um, is, is can be helpful with the community transmission piece. I'm going to take a second to talk about close contact definition because I've had a few questions about that. So um, this is all available on the AOE website, but um, to be sort of general about this, a close con when there's a case in school, there'll be contact tracing. Now the contact tracing will say who is considered a close contact during this child's infectious period, which would be two days before um, they started to have symptoms or two days before a positive test. So they look and say, which, unvaccinated person, person or persons, were in the indoor setting within three feet um, for more than 15 minutes over 24 hours. Um, it, as long as they're masked, we use a three foot definition. If, they, if they're not masked indoors, it's a six foot definition. Um, so in, you can imagine in like a kindergarten class, it's probably gonna end up being everyone in the class, but maybe in like a fifth grade classroom, they're, it, potentially it could be just half the class, um, sort of depends on the day and how, and how things kind of roll out. Um, on the bus, it's the seat mate, if there's a, someone sitting next to the student because in, on the, in the bus setting, everyone's masks and we are recommending windows are, are open. So in the bus, it's just the seat mate. And then if it's outdoors, we're not doing any contact tracing in that setting. So some folks had asked um, 
well, what do I do if my child's considered a close contact and I'm that my child's not participating in the test of state program? And it's just, the answer is it's just what's happening now. So you would do, so the test to say is really just saying right now, if your child is a close contact, they have to, you know, they quarantine at home. And then at the seven day mark, they take their PCR test. If it's negative, they come back to school. What we're saying is that that pathway, the stay at home, get a PCR test is very similar to the test to stay program, which is a child comes comes to school, gets tested, and if they're negative, they can come to school, that either of those two pathways result in the same amount of, of positive tests. And so your option is, um, is that you can have your child in the test to stay program. If you don't want your child in the test to stay program, you would just continue with, with the flow that's working right now, which is, or in place right now, which is that your child gets, is quarantined at home. Someone followed up to the Williston comments about when does this start? Um, each school is going to roll this out on their time frame, and you should hear from your school or school district about when this will be starting, but not soon enough in Williston. Um, and I think our other schools, my school as well. Um, I um, and then I think for the Williston schools, it's just more that there's just been a rolling amount of positive tests, so some families are identified as close contacts a couple of times, but yes, still investigating, um, still investigating both outbreaks and um, how to best um, keep kids safe and healthy in schools. But yes, cannot start soon enough in some of our schools. So um, the who will be administering the test will probably be school based as um, school nurses I know in our um, CVSD district. I'm not sure about other districts about who would be administering the test. Um, and then um, also just remembering that if you like, I did say that the class would participate in test to say only the parents who elect to participate in test to stay would be participating in test to stay. So it would be offered to the entire kindergarten class, for example, if there was a contact in our case in the class. Um, but only those who whose parents elect to participate in this would participate. I do not know about educational opportunities for a child who's not participating in test to stay. I think that will be school dependent on what the school is able to provide while you're home quarantined if you don't elect to stay and test to stay. Jill, do you have any comments on who's um, administering the test at each school? There's a big, there's a big variation. Um, so, uh, so I, important to know, it may, it may feel in Williston right now, like, oh, we're behind, but um, actually we're just having the very first districts and schools rolling out uh, test to stay like this week. Um, we had one um, uh, sort of emergency response up in Canaan um, a, a week ago, and we just had uh, Maple Run begin doing antigen testing uh, just yesterday. Um, so in fact, test kits are rolling out on trucks right now. Um, it is important for folks to know, because I'm getting a lot of questions in the chat, there's an onboarding process for this. We don't sort of just ship them out. Um, in order to be able to use these test kits, uh, I wasn't gonna sort of dive into the weeds on this, but districts need to get something that's called a CLIA waiver. It essentially allows a school to function as a laboratory, which makes sense here, right? So with PCR tests, we ship those tests off to the Broad Institute in Massachusetts, and they, that's where the laboratory is. For antigen tests, sort of the, the point where the test is being done becomes the laboratory. So schools need to, or districts need to um, get a CLIA waiver. They need to do training um, on how to use the test kits with the manufacturer. Uh, they need to get registered in simple report. They need to ensure that they can dispose, store and dispose of the antigen test kits as medical waste properly. So there is a whole series of steps that they need to do. And as soon as they have sort of completed those steps, they reach out to us. We hit the uh, submit button on the test kit order, and then they get turned around really quickly. Um, so uh, we are pushing those test kits out like right now. 
um, the universal response test and consent form went out to the field yesterday. So it, it hasn't been sitting around. Um, and so that is kind of the, the series of steps that has to happen. And then the other big piece that, that sort of needs to be understood here, and I think that probably all of you already know this, is that our schools are um, really challenged with staffing right now. Uh, there is staffing needs across the whole breadth of uh, schools in every kind of um, you know, bus drivers, food service workers, nurses, teachers, all of the sort of education workforce system is extremely stressed right now. And um, so in order to do a, um, a test to stay program and to have it be sustainable and effective, you schools need to ensure that they're going to have the staff to be able to do it, right? So we do see that in some districts, they are um, leveraging volunteers. Uh, we do see in some districts that they are um, able to find part-time staff. And I will just sort of signal this, that um, the state is also working on the issue of staffing and it's, it's not a money issue, it's a bodies issue, right? There's just not a lot of people who are signing on to do these jobs uh, that, that want to, you know, just across the, the entire ed workforce right now. Um, so that is a really critical piece. And that's why it is really important what Dr. Costello was just signaling, um, you know, when is this going to happen? When is it going to roll out and who's going to do it? Those are really good questions. And every school is actually trying to, and every district is actually trying to address those questions in real time right now. Um, so you may see that in your school, it may be the school nurse and maybe some additional staff. They may reach out to you and say, hey, we need parent volunteers to make this happen. You might see, um, I was just in, in uh, Barry City Schools today talking to their staff and they were saying like, can we talk to our volunteer firefighter force? And I said, absolutely. You know, this is sort of an all hands on deck. And I think it's also, um, you know, important to sort of recognize like we're in this crunch right now, right? And so I really do think it is sort of a, an all hands on deck effort um, and, and really trying to bring to bear every resource that's available. Um, so you may see this play out differently in every single school in different ways. Um, to be able to ensure that it will happen. But I do, I do want to emphasize again, and I, I sort of find myself saying this message a lot. It's, it is important to recognize that you do not need someone with a medical background, like this doesn't need to be Dr. Bell, <laughs> and you know, that needs to be swabbing, swabbing the kiddo. These are the test kits that you could get from Walgreens. Um, you know, these are, uh, it's just a simple nasal swab, and it's a really simple test kit. Um, so you may see a whole variety of people who have done some training on how to do this, uh, who are engaged in the process. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I think one of the questions around that was specifically like teachers becoming doctors. Um, I doubt teacher, classroom teachers specifically would be involved in this. I assume it would be other staff within the school because kids would be returning to their classroom as they get negative mm -hmm. tests. So um, someone asked again about prioritizing Williston. I can say it's coming really soon in CVSD. Um, our um, it, Jocelyn Bouye, who is the COVID coordinator who um, couldn't be on this call this evening is very committed to this. And um, you should have received an email to sign your children up um, and I'm in Heinsberg. I know that we received an email yesterday, I believe, or this morning, um, and that you can um, you can sign sign your kids up, and it is coming very soon. Um, so that person just wrote back that they signed up immediately. Excellent. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm excited for this program. Um, I think this will keep kids in school and also be very safe. Um, I feel very safe having my six and nine year old participate in this in Heinsberg if they need to. Fingers crossed they don't. Yeah. So um, there were many questions. I know they were kind of comfy. The chat functionality unfortunately didn't work as well as um, and, and the power went out in Shelburne. I was going to do this from my parents' house. Um, but the um, so I think we um, 
I hope that we answered many of them. If not, please reach out to your, um, your school district COVID coordinator or your school nurse and they can get questions to us that we can answer. New programs always have some bumps in the road. We all know that. Be kind. Um, know that your school nurses and school staff are really trying to work this out and um, do have a large support team of us behind them, but that it can be bumpy. Um, if you feel like one day you get one message and one day you get another, I think that just happens and being um, being okay with that and knowing that everyone is really trying trying their best right now. But as Jill alluded to, staffing is a challenge in all settings. Um, and then stay tuned for our vaccine um, Q and A's as well, because that's just really exciting. Um, I think all of us were refreshing the news every 20 minutes, probably on Tuesday, waiting for that FDA <laughs> announcement. So, um, but um, I think we'll close out now. Um, I, do the three of you have any other questions that are coming in to you? No, but I, I do want to echo um, what everyone said and just say that we feel from a medical perspective that this this is a very safe alternative and a great so you know a great way to keep children in school without furthering the spread of COVID. It is so logistically complicated and challenging. I mean, we're in this, these meetings all the time. So just having patience um, with everyone involved and especially with school administrators and school nurses, especially there's a lot going on and there's gonna be some growing pains around this. So, so thank you for your patience. Yeah, I would- Getting a lot of accolades on my thing, just to, I wanna share with everybody that, um, thank you. Like there, people are just very appreciative of this tonight. So thank you to everyone. Go ahead, Jill. Yeah, I was gonna say, I just, um, I would really second what Dr. Bell and Dr. Costello have shared. This is, inc it's incredibly challenging and complex. Uh, you know, it really is. There is um, a dedicated team at the state level, Dr. Lee and Dr. Bell are incredible partners for us. Um, and so it's been a huge team effort and it has been um, amazing to see what our school um, staff and administrators have done. It's really incredible. And uh, so I will say both as a, a person who works at AOE and leads this effort and also as a parent, like I just cannot thank everybody enough and, um, and we'll all continue to forge ahead. and. And um, you know, every day it's pretty much like a thousand, a thousand small problems that need to get solved, and it, that's happening at the state level and it's happening at the schools. So we're just going to keep forging ahead and keep solving those problems and and uh, the you know slaying dragons, as I like to tell myself when I get up in the morning. <laughs> so thank you all very much for the time tonight. Really appreciate it and your questions. Thank you all. Um, we'll close out at this point and please reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you.